Good evening and welcome to the European Parliament. Again, you're here with the Greens. We're asking the question, uh, do European governments want to reduce poverty and can a European minimum income over the poverty line uh, be the answer? We're here to have a live conversation with our audiences with Sarah Mathieu, uh, Green MEP from Belgium. You're very welcome. The simplest question first, of course, is what exactly is a minimum income? Because a lot of people may not necessarily know or there's some differences between the different, uh, different items. Indeed, and there's often also a bit of confusion, like what's the difference with a minimum wage, etc. So what's the idea of a minimum income? It's really for those people that don't have a job, so they are out of the labor markets and they don't have access to, for instance, unemployment benefits. There can be different situations, of course, why uh, that would be the case. Um, you could be uh, long-term sick, for instance. Uh, perhaps there is no access to job for you in your specific region. Um, perhaps you lack some of the skills that are needed. Perhaps the jobs uh, that you are um, being, uh, being presented with uh, are not quality jobs uh, or don't have a decent uh, wage. But it could also be, for instance, um, which is often the case when it comes to women, uh, that you are taking care uh, of others, of children, of elderly, um, and that means that, of course, you are without an income. And that's why we think it's important for everyone in Europe to have this kind of safety net, uh, that there will always be uh, an income that is really adequate, adequate to, well, make sure that your basic needs are covered. That means housing, that means food, uh, etc. And it's really important because there's a lot of people uh, in Europe right now that actually don't have access uh, to a minimum income that is really adequate. And that's very problematic because I think really this is a human right uh, and we should make sure uh, that everyone in Europe has that access and can actually have a life uh, in dignity. So why now? Why, why is the European Parliament talking about this? And I think there was also, maybe you could talk about the European Commission has also come with recommendations. A lot of people at home might think, well, at EU level, there is not much uh, competence on mm -hmm. social issues um, when it comes to these sort of things and the welfare state and all mm. of the rest. So what is the EU's role and why is this important now? Well, why is it important now? I'm sure that, that you and all of the people are, that are watching know that we are in a cost of living crisis and that there's a lot of poverty right now in Europe, that people are really having trouble making ends meet, that it's for them impossible to have a decent uh, living. And in that sense, it's very timely, I would say, to have this debate because this could be a very important tool to try and to eradicate poverty in Europe. And I think that that's something that we all want, right? Um, now, what did the Commission do? Uh, the Commission came up with a recommendation for the member states to actually have these minimum income schemes and have them above the poverty line. And that last part is really important important because right now actually all member states have some kinds uh, of minimum income but the problem is that they are not high enough they are not above the poverty line and so what we know um, when you look at uh, well social legislation and and you know the way that the social welfare system in in, uh, in europe works recommendations well that doesn't work very well um, we've seen that uh, in the past if you just recommend things don't actually change and that's why we think, uh, as Greens, if it's really important to have a directive, to have a legislation, so that member states are actually obliged uh, to raise uh, those minimum income schemes above the poverty line. And that's really what we want to do right now. Uh, and I think the sooner the better uh, to make sure that we now in the cost of living crisis can actually help people but also because member states have said uh, well at the porto summit that they want to lift 15 million people out of poverty by 2030. well if that's your goal and that's even not uh, very ambitious i would argue then you really need to have strong tools and you know a directive on a minimum income would really help just to come back on some of the uh, the, the figures there um we, we, in, in our briefing from our group, we have that there's a gender poverty gap has actually increased over the last five years. 
uh, the, the, the effort to tackle poverty is kind of flatlined a little bit. It's not necessary that we're, there's, I think there's already, there's 96.5 million people at risk of poverty in the EU, which is 21% of the overall population. So the, the question at, at the opening of do European governments actually want to solve the poverty crisis or not is still a very open one. I mean, it doesn't look like we're doing particularly well when you see some of the, the figures currently. Indeed, it's not going in the right direction. Uh, and of course, it's one thing to have nice declarations at a summit, etc. But you need to put literally your money where your mouth is. Yeah. And that's what's not happening right now. It's really a political choice because, I mean, let's be honest, most member states do have the means to do this. They just choose not to. Yeah, and I think people will be also shocked to find that for welfare or for, for minimum income, it's below the poverty line, which mm -hmm. basically means that it, it's perpetuating poverty. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not adding any benefit necessarily to people's, people's lives. It's, it's keeping people just mm -hmm. barely getting by. Yeah. And that's in the majority of EU countries. Indeed, there's only two member states well, they, they have a minimum income that is close uh, to that poverty cap, but the rest, yeah, they are completely inadequate. And indeed, in that sense, if you want to lift people out of poverty, if you really want to give them the tools um, to be part of society, to find a job, uh, to have an education, etc., this is key. Uh, if you mean it, uh, then this is really what you need to do. So, in all of this, what is your role exactly uh, um, as rapporteur? What does that mean and, and, and what are the next steps for the file? Well, the role is, of course, that I will be in the driving seat, um, both in the negotiations of the text uh, that we had and then now when it comes to the vote. And it's, of course, up to me to convince the colleagues that this is actually something that we need to strive for as a parliament. And that means having a lot of discussions, uh, coming up with a lot of numbers, coming up with a lot of studies to actually show why this is so important. And well, I'm, uh, I'm hoping uh, that this will be enough. Uh, I hope that we can convince all the colleagues that this is really the way to go. Uh, and I think it could be a very strong signal coming from the Parliament vis-à-vis -vis the Member States and the Commission uh, if we actually get this vote and if we get the directive in. And to be very political, what is it looking like? Are there groups in support? Is it kind of a left-right classic divide? Or um, what, what's it looking like in terms of the House? Well, it is a bit of a left-right divide, although in some of the more conservative groups, there are also people actually supporting this. Uh, and I'm glad to say so. Um, but sometimes it takes a little bit longer uh, to convince uh, certain conservative colleagues from EPP or Renew, for instance, uh, that this is actually the way to go. But, you know, we can be very persistent. Good. OK, so I'll go now to some questions from the audience. And thank you for uh, sending your questions in advance. And if you have any, you can still send them in and we'll, we'll do our best to get to them. So we have a question from Cyril. Um, what are the requirements to be eligible for minimum income? Well, those requirements are actually different in the different member states. So for that alone, it would be good to have a directive because that would harmonize it more. And I mean, it's also one of the issues uh, because 20% of the people that are now unemployed are not even eligible for a minimum income. That's a whole big number, I would say. And so, for instance, in some member states, uh, what is the problem? They have uh, an age requirement. Uh, that means that for some that are already adults uh, that are 18 years old, they would not be eligible uh, for a minimum income. Um, and that, of course, is very problematic. Why? Because, well, if you want to emancipate uh, young people, if they, for instance, I don't know, don't have the means um, to, to do a certain study, uh, if perhaps they are at odds with their family, um, they won't have access to a minimum income and not have access to the future that they envisage uh, for themselves. One of the other things, for instance, that are uh, requirements in some member states is uh, a minimum uh, time of national residency which is, of course, also problematic uh, for some people because, I mean, for instance, who are the ones that we are trying to lift out of poverty? It's often people with a migration background. It's Roma. Well, you know, in, in this sense, the eligibility, of course, is, uh, is a big issue. Uh, so I think there, uh, there is still a lot of work to do uh, to make sure that everyone that needs it can actually get it. 
And a side question from me, when we talk about a directive, what are we talking about? Because there are different proposals that can come from the Commission, can come from uh, different legislative initiatives, but a directive means what exactly for the, for the people back home? It would mean that we would have a harmonized approach, right? Yeah. Um, so it would mean that all those member states would need to put um, the minimum income above the poverty line. Of course, that poverty line is not the same in all member states. Yeah, okay. Let's be very yeah. clear. Uh, so what we're saying is it should be 60% of the national median income. If you look at, for instance, Belgium, where I'm from, um, that would mean um, that we would get, what is it, so I don't say, um, say it wrongly. Now we have uh, 809 for a single person. If you would put that above the poverty line, it's 1,085. Uh, so we know that now in Belgium, there's 14.9% uh, that actually have that problem. Yeah. If you look at Bulgaria, it's a very different number. Uh, there, a minimum income above the poverty line would be 257 mm -hmm. euro. And there, uh, there's 22% that are actually living uh, below that standard. So it's not that we say there's a one size fits yeah. all. Yeah. Uh, member states have different social welfare systems. That's all fine. Uh, but that should be the bare minimum uh, that people can actually live in dignity. OK, we actually have three people asking the same question, Jean-Marc, Willem and Cornelia. Why calculate the amount based on median income and not real needs? Yeah, it's a good question because, of course, it's an arbitrary number, um, but you have to put your threshold somewhere. And we know with individual means testing, etc., that this is really what you need to pay your gas bills, uh, to pay for food, uh, to pay for housing, etc. That doesn't mean that if you get that, all is well. Um, it's also, if you want to lift people out of poverty, it needs to be combined with access to housing, with access to education, etc. So it's not as simple as just saying, you know what, if we have uh, the 60% of the national minimum income, then all is well. Yeah. Um, I mean, th there's also, there is, maybe we've all grown up in the last 30 years of a different view uh, from governments and from capitalism about uh, what the welfare state and how small or big it needs to be. Um, and there's a lot of maybe hoops put in to, to prevent, well, on one hand, people not going for a job, but also maybe from another point of view to see people being pushed back into the job, job market as much as possible. Um, we have a question from Saxon um, on this. For, for those that avoid work, uh, but are capable, how should the governments handle that issue? But this is a typical framing, yeah. I think, that is used where uh, the welfare state is seen as something that is the opposite uh, of helping people into labor. And I don't agree with that point of view at all. I mean, even the Commission doesn't ap approve uh, with that vision. And in that sense, it has even said uh, that it should be possible for a temporary period to even combine minimum income uh, with a wage. Um, I think if you want to get those that can work uh, back on the labor market, you need to support them. I mean, it's very difficult if you're stuck in poverty to actually have the mind space yeah. to go and look for a job, to send out resumes, to perhaps even have access to, I don't know, a computer to put your resume on, etc. So if you have that bit of safety, it can actually help you uh, to re-enter the labor market if possible, because of course, there's people with handicaps, there are long-term ill people, uh, there are those that are taking care of children where, where perhaps there is no adequate um, you know, support uh, to put their children into daycare, etc. Um, so I think this could actually emancipate people. It could also help them not um, being forced to have to accept a job where there is no decent wage, when there is no decent working conditions, etc. So to me, it's not or or. Uh, this can be part of a strategy uh, to get people back on the labor market. But for me, the condition is really it needs to be quality jobs and it needs to be a decent wage. And what, what do you say to I, I, because it is an argument that people hear a lot, this idea, well, if we bump up the, the, the welfare for people, uh, it, it's less attractive to go into work. Um, and maybe that's not even just the far right or the right saying it. I think a lot of it's, it's something that made me feel if, mm. or for people who are working, it usually comes from people who are working. Um, why should my tax dollars, tax euros go into paying for people who, who are not working? What do you say to that sort of uh, line of narrative around it? 
Well, like I said, I don't believe uh, that people want to stay in poverty if there's another way around it. And it's not like, you know, the even if we put it above poverty line, that this is going to be super comfortable. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And that's why, for instance, it would be a good idea, even if it's for a, a limited period, that you can combine it with work. In that sense, people don't have the feeling that they are losing their social entitlements uh, if they want to uh, to look for a job, like they are not punished uh, in that way. Yeah. And so, you know, I think it's a, it's a strange way of looking at it. Uh, in that sense, for those that really can't work, I mean, it could happen to you if you are, for instance, in a car accident or whatever, not of your own fault. Uh, does that mean that those people need to be in poverty for the rest of their life? I don't think so. That's not how our welfare state system should work. Yeah. Um, another question from Costas on a different issue um, relating to energy prices, which may be interconnected. We see big oil corporations making huge profits. Is it not better to focus on lowering prices for people than focusing on this sort of initiative? Well, I think that's hugely important. And I mean, it's something that we have been pushing for uh, since the beginning of this whole energy crisis. Uh, and I think that, well, indeed, we need to do both. Um, there are some long term and some short term solutions. Uh, as a group, what we really advocate on the short term is schemes like a direct uh, support for people um, and their energy bills. We want to avoid that people are being cut off uh, from energy. We want to avoid that people are evicted from their homes, uh, for instance, because they can't uh, make their rent. Um, I mean, these are all things that you could do on the short term. On the long term, of course, we really need to invest much more into the renovation of housing. Yeah. Uh, we really need to support people because the most vulnerable, those that are living in energy poverty, they can't afford to put solar panels on their roofs or to pay for insulation, etc. So we really need to have very strong European funding there uh, to make sure that actually people are helped. And I mean, we all know that the most cheap energy is the one that you don't use. And if you do use it, the cheapest is renewables. Uh, but that means you really need to help people uh, to actually achieve that. And on the other hand, of course, we have all these, well, fossil industry companies making millions and millions uh, of euros there. What we are really saying is you need to tax those excess, excessive profits and you need to invest that into climate and social solutions. So I think if we do that and if we actually have this directive on minimum income, that would really help a lot of people out in this cost of living crisis. Yeah, that it's, it's, it's a multi-pronged uh, attack on poverty. We actually have a related question, which you may have answered, but I'll ask anyway from, from, from uh, Orlando. Um, when you get out of it or why you get out of poverty, pe people, uh, well, sorry, excuse me, um, people who can't own their own apartment, I think is what the question is based on. Will your programs help people, for instance, uh, get their own apartment? I mean, we were talking about it just before we started. Mm. Housing is a major issue for people, mm. people everywhere. Um, I guess this is a part of the suite, but it's not going to answer every mm. problem that, that, we've, that, a, that a city mm. or a country faces. No, definitely. And I think we need to have much more investment also in social housing um, and in support of renters, for instance, uh, because indeed this is, this is part of, of the whole uh, conundrum that, that we are in. And if you want to tackle poverty, housing is a really important tool. Um, of course, it's not just a question of helping ownership uh, in that sense. I think that's a mistake that has been made for, for quite some time. If you really want to focus on the poorest in society, social housing and subsidies for rent, etc., is really the way to go. Yeah. Okay, I think I might just pick out of my list as I go through it one last question and then we might wrap up. Um, this is a tricky one. I don't know if you can answer it or not. Uh, is your demand, in your opinion, a better solution than universal income, or do you see it as a stepping stone to European-wide universal income, already as already proposed and trialed in certain uh, European states? Well, I like the concepts of the universal basic income, which is then for everyone, so not just the ones uh, that are unemployed and, and don't have any kind of, uh, of income. I think it could 
be very interesting in the sense that it really strengthens people, emancipates people. Uh, if you have that kind of safety net, uh, you can be in a much better bargaining position uh, in the demand for quality jobs. Because of course, if everyone has this kind of universal basic income, well, employers are going to have to make sure that all the jobs are actually the kind of jobs that people want to, uh, want to take. At the same time, well, you know, it's still quite experimental. Um, there are some member states where there have been experiments or still uh, experiments ongoing, and I think it's a good thing. But I think it will take time uh, to really convince everyone that this is really a good idea. And so in that sense, I would be very pragmatic and say this already exists uh, in all member states. It's much easier and it's more timely uh, if we want to raise, you know, poverty, the, the income above the poverty levels, and if we want to make sure during this cost of living crisis we don't push people even further down, down the water line, well, this is a pressing issue. We can't wait for it. So, yeah, in the long run, it's an interesting thought. In the short run, I think this is really the way to go. For lifting poverty, this is one of the, not a silver bullet, but one of the tools that we need to really think about. So an important week this week, vote on Thursday now confirmed in the last 45 minutes, I think. Um, what's your assessment of where we are? And even after this week, what do you think needs to happen um, as we go to the 2024 elections, for instance? Yeah. Well, I'm already happy that we got the support for a directive in the committee. Uh, and that was a big step forward. Now I'm really hoping to convince the colleagues in plenary and we will do our utmost also with civil society, uh, with poverty organizations, etc., to make that the case. If we don't succeed, then we just continue fighting because that's what we need to do. Um, but yeah, I'm still hopeful. Uh, I really hope that during this cost of living crisis where people are so much in, in, in misery, that the colleagues would actually see that this is really an important thing to support. A big historical step ahead. Sarah Matthew, thanks, thanks a million for joining us and thanks to everyone watching. Um, we will continue to have these live streams uh, in plenaries in the future and you can also sign up on our website for more information. So see you next time. Thank you.